Hello, everybody. So I'm Aaron Crane, Cutbot, and I'm here to talk about what Redis is and how to get most out of it with some of its unusual features. Now, I've become a pretty big fan of Redis over the last year or two. It's a fairly small, fast system, and it fits pretty well with my brain. I'm even inclined to describe it as fairly pearlish. But it's not necessarily easy to understand exactly what it offers. So I suppose the first question about Redis is simply, what is it? And that's not an easy question to answer. The short version is just, it's a data store, but that doesn't help much. In fact, it's almost easier to start by asking, what isn't Redis? And there's a good list of things that Redis isn't. It's not a relational database like MySQL or Postgres or SQLite or Oracle or SQL Server or anything like that. So if it floats your boat, you can happily call it NoSQL. It's not a document database like MongoDB or CouchDB for anyone who's looked into those. The closest comparison is something like Memcached, but Redis isn't exactly a simple key value store either. It's also not itself a distributed system, though you could use it to build one. One way to think about it is as a remote data structure server. Redis keeps track of a collection of named variables, or keys as the Redis documentation puts it, and each variable has one of five data types. There are scalars, lists, and hashes, which all work much the same way as their Perl equivalents. And there are also sets and sorted sets. They each have their uses, and we'll encounter a few of them later. Redis does have some limitations, though. Uh, I think these are the ones that are most important to understand before trying to use it. One of the crucial things is that Redis stores every last bit of your data in memory. That means you absolutely need enough RAM in your server to store everything you want. Another is that the server executes all queries in a single thread. That does mean that the throughput of a single Redis daemon is limited by CPU speed, but it has the benefit that it becomes very easy to reason about your application's data consistency requirements. There's no transaction isolation level like in SQL, for example. Also, we'll see later on that there are some fairly easy ways to deal with that restriction in practice, especially since the bottleneck for high throughput applications is often memory usage or network bandwidth rather than CPU speed per se. Another useful way to think about Redis is that rather than being a database itself, it's more like a database construction kit. It doesn't have indexing or aggregate queries or general purpose joins or other things that you might expect if you're used to relational databases. That's not to say you can't do things like that, but you'll need to write application level code to do some of the work. So I think at this point it's probably best to show an example of how a simple application might actually use Redis. Suppose you've got a news site of some sort and you want to show a list of popular posts. Actually calculating the popular posts might be quite time consuming. So if you do that on every page request, things will probably be quite slow. But the actual data probably doesn't need to be calculated all the time. It won't change much from one minute to the next. So we can speed things up by caching the list of popular posts. Enter Redis. So let's introduce a cron job or something like that that calculates the popular stories in the usual way by looking up the data in the database. Once it's got the list of popular stories, it saves the result to Redis. Then the app simply looks up the popular stories in Redis rather than the database and carries on from there. So what does that look like in terms of actually speaking to Redis? How, do we, how exactly do we store the data and what Redis queries do we need to issue? One simple option is to use something like JSON to serialize the list of popular posts and just store the resulting blob of JSON data in a single Redis scalar. That means that your application code will need to decode the JSON it gets back, but that's easy enough and pretty fast. So this slide shows you the sort of requests that you can send to Redis. We've got a set command that sets a named scalar variable to a new value, creating it first if necessary. And there's a corresponding get command that retrieves whatever you put in that variable. And Redis commands like get and set serve the same sort of purpose as select and update in SQL, though there are a lot more Redis commands than SQL statements. So one obvious question for this example is, what if you have multiple sections and you want to display per section popular stories? An easy option is to adopt a namespacing convention for your Redis variables, embedding some kind of section, section identifier into the variable name. 
In this case, the identifier is just a string, but you could just as well use a numeric ID if that works for your application. I like to separate name components with a dot, as you can see. Some people like to use a colon. Whatever convention you pick, that's fine. Another possibility is to use a Redis hash, with the section identifier used as a key inside the hash, the same sort of way you might in Perl, of course. So Redis has hset and hget commands for setting and getting elements of a hash. So what factors would affect your decision about whether to use a single Redis hash or multiple Redis scalars? Well, one difference is that memory usage is probably slightly lower with the hash approach. That's very unlikely to matter for an, an example this small, but if you're trying to store a large amount of data in Redis, it's worth measuring memory usage for a variety of different data layout options. Another difference relates to another part of Redis, automatic key expiry. The idea is that you can tell Redis that a particular variable should expire after a certain number of seconds, and once the appropriate amount of time has elapsed, the variable will disappear. That sounds like a pretty useful sort of a thing for automatic caching, especially since your app can adjust an existing variable's expiry time when necessary. You can also configure Redis with a memory usage limit and have it automatically expire little used variables when the limit is reached. This is pretty similar to the way memcached works, though Redis does have several additional configuration settings. <coughs> the thing about expiry is that it only works on a whole variable at a time. So if you cache your popular stories data in a hash, all of it expires simultaneously. On the other hand, if you have a separate scalar for each section's data, they can expire independently. I'm not going to say much else about expiry, but you can probably think of plenty of other ways that you could use a feature like that. So going back to the web caching example, just for a moment, we were assuming that there's a database with enough data to calculate the list of popular stories, and that it doesn't need to be very up-to-date. But some use cases kind of look superficially similar, but with different constraints. Suppose, for example, you're running an online game, and you want a leaderboard of the top scoring players. If you have a lot of players, you probably have to make sure that the leaderboard is always up to date, or as up to date as possible. You'll find that people will want to see how they compare with everyone else. And modeling that in a relational database would be pretty easy. You'd have a table with users and scores, and you insert and update and delete as needed. And then when you want to display the actual leaderboard, you do a select with order by score desk, or something like that. The problem with that is that to make the select query fast enough, you'll need an index on the score column. But if you do that, updates will have to re-index the data on disk, so they'll be slow, and they'll do quite a lot of I.O. And if you have a lot of people playing your game, well, that's potentially going to be a problem. So how can Redis help? The obvious approach here is to use the sorted set data type. Now, I think this is one of the most interesting and unusual parts of Redis. A sorted set has two parts. as a set of unique strings, and each string has an associated numeric score. And crucially, you can treat the scores as providing an ordering over the strings. This means you can retrieve the elements in score order, paging through them if necessary, and you can also calculate the rank for a particular element, its position in that score-based ordering. And all of this is really fast. All the important operations take logarithmic time, including insertion, deletions, and score updates. And that's because internally, Redis uses a hash for the, skip, for the set and a skip list for ordering the elements by score. So hopefully you can start seeing how this would help when calculating a leaderboard for your game. First you have to pick a way to represent players as elements in the sorted set. An obvious choice in many applications might be to use the player ID directly. Then when a player racks up a new score, you insert the ID into the appropriate sorted set with their game score as the sorted set score. So that's the, this zadd command and you'll notice that all the sorted set commands begin with a Z. Then you can trivially pull out the top player IDs with the scores using this Z rev range command. So this is uh, find a range from the sorted set in reverse order so that higher scores come first. And this is really fast, even when the sorted set is very large. You might expect a couple of milliseconds. Fast. But even better, it offers some features that you can't easily get with a SQL solution. Suppose you want to display not only the best players, but the players near the current player. That's easy enough with Redis. First use uh, Z rev rank to get the player's rank, and again with the rev is to order the scores from high to low. Then once you know their rank, 
you can just look for players whose rank is in the appropriate range using the Z rev range command again. And again, this is all still really fast, all logarithmic time. For comparison, I think doing this in SQL would be a lot more awkward. You'd probably maybe select by score range, but then you have the risk that you need to do some additional queries if the range doesn't happen to include many scores. I think sorted sets are one of Redis's most interesting features. They turn out to be a pretty natural fit for a variety of common problems. Here's another use case that works well for them. Maintaining a set of the most recently seen elements. For example, suppose you've got an online shop and you want to keep track of every product the user has looked at within a given time period. So you can have a sorted set for each user, probably embedding the user ID into the variable name. Then every time a user views a product, you record that fact in their sorted set using the Unix time as the score. So that's the Z add command again. Then you can pull out the whole list with Z range. Zero and minus one here are indexes. Negative numbers count from the end like Perl array indexing. Finally, you can delete old product view entries with Z rem range by score. So you calculate the last Unix time you're interested in and delete everything whose score is in the appropriate range, anything older than that. And of course, you get this nice feature that the uniqueness property of sorted sets means that a product can only appear once. Now, I do like sorted sets. They work well for some things, but sometimes they're overkill. Simple data structures are sometimes good enough. For example, suppose that rather than trying to maintain a set of the products seen within some time period, you just want a list of notifications a user might want to look at. But you want to limit that list length directly rather than limiting to views within a time period. So that could be done with a sorted set, but if that's all you're using the scoring mechanism for, you're probably better off with a simple list. So Redis lists, they're a bit like Perl arrays, but they're implemented with linked lists internally, which means that adding and deleting elements at either end is fast, but pulling one from the middle can be much slower if the list is long. Uh, but still, that's perfect for this use case. You can push a notification onto a per user list, so here I've used the R push command, which adds to the right-hand side of the list, like Perl's push built-in. Then you can delete older notifications with the L trim command, which tells Redis to get rid of list items that fall outside the given range of indexes. Here I've used minus 100 and minus 1 as the indexes, so we keep the 100 notifications most recently pushed to the list. Suppose you want to fetch the items in the opposite order, most recent first. Well, one option would be to just reverse the list in the application. That's not a terrible idea. But remember that Redis lists support efficient insertions at either end. So we can just change which end we're operating on. We use the L push command instead of R push to push onto the left hand side of the list. That's much like Perl's unshift built in. Then we change the range of indexes given to L trim. So we keep the first 100 notifications rather than the last 100. Easy enough. There are plenty of other use cases for which Redis lists are a good fit. So one of them is a job queue. So many applications have a lot of background tasks um, in a way that can't easily be handled with cron jobs or something like that. So you probably have several parallel workers, each of which can handle any of your tasks, so that each worker can pick out the next, next task to execute, do whatever's needed, and carry on. And the parts of your system that produce tasks can build a string indicating what needs to be done. Maybe that even involves that the string is just a record, the idea of a, a record in a, another database saying what needs to be done. But whatever you have, you push that string onto the appropriate list. And each worker can just use the rpop command to fetch and delete the oldest element of the list. So rpop is like Perl, Perl's pop built in. What happens, though, if the list is empty? Well, that's easy. The R part just quietly returns nothing. The worker can detect that and react accordingly. Maybe it should sleep for a few seconds and try again. But that would mean polling, which isn't a great idea. Fortunately, there's another option. Blocking operations. Instead of the plain R pop command, you can use BR pop, which tells Redis to block until there's a task available for you to process. Perfect. The zero here means that you're willing to be blocked forever, or you can supply a timeout in seconds. There's still a problem though. Suppose the worker crashes while you're handling this task. For some applications, that might not be a problem. But in many cases, losing a task would be. You'd really need to prevent that happening. 
So we want a way to keep track of which jobs are being worked on so we can periodically look for failed ones and retry them. Just using RPOP or BRPOP isn't good enough because the POP element gets sent back to the client and then effectively thrown away as far as the Redis server can tell. Instead, we want to make sure that when Redis pops an element off the queue, it also stores it in another list. So that can be done with the brpopl-push command, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it breaks down sensibly enough. We do a blocking right-hand pop from one list, that's the, the tasks list in this example, and push it to the, left, to the left of another list. And there's also a variant without the b, which does the same thing, but without blocking. So once the work has done that, it can process the job as normal, and when it finishes, it just deletes the job from the active list. So you can then periodically examine the whole of the active list and use a timeout to find jobs whose worker has crashed. That does mean you need to be able to work out how long a job has been on the active list. So sometimes you might have a way outside Redis to do that, but if you don't, you still have other options. But for example, instead of having a single list of active tasks, you could use one list for each worker. When the worker finds a task to execute, it also stores the current time in the same list, and then, once a job has been processed, you can delete the entire thing. So, finding failed jobs involves reading each worker's active list. Um, the L range command fetches the elements of a list using a range of indexes, but doesn't change the list itself, unlike the pop commands. The start time stored in the list will let you work out how long the worker has been dealing with this job, and then, if it's been too long, you can assume that the worker has crashed and return the task to the queue. So, let's move on to a rather different example statistics gathering. So one really simple form of this is just hit counting. Counting how many times your users have read a story or viewed a product or what have you. Redis has an incra command, much like Perl's plus plus operator, it treats the value stored in the key as a number and adds one to it. So every time a user views some story, you increment that story's hit count. Or if you prefer, you can store each hit count in a, in a hash and use the h incra by command. And the trade-offs there are essentially the same as we saw for set and h set earlier. Either way, fetching the hit count is easy enough. How about if you want to measure statistics over a variety of time periods? Well, that's a little trickier. The simple thing is just to record the hit multiple times, one for each granularity you care about. So actually reporting the hit counts over time will involve fetching the counts for each unit in the appropriate range at the appropriate granularity. So in this example, we're looking at daily hit counts for a story for a three-day period. It's the three hget commands at the bottom. Now, some people would look at this and get maybe a bit nervous about all these commands, especially if they think, well, oh, there's all these h incra by queries needed to record the hit counts. And it is true that if each Redis command needed a network round trip to the server, that could be slow. Fortunately, Redis has a simple way to handle that, which is pipelining. So if your Redis client library supports it, you can send a series of commands to Redis at once and wait for all the responses to come back before processing any of them. That's pretty much perfect for a situation like this. There's only one network round trip for all the commands. And this can have a huge effect on Redis throughput in terms of commands executed per second. In fact, high throughput applications will almost certainly need to use pipelining to maximize CPU utilization. And if you're speaking to Redis from Perl and, you know, why wouldn't you? Then the redis.pm library does support pipelining. There may be others, um, but uh, there are certainly other Redis clients on CPAM, but I don't know which of them do support pipelining. Um, going back to using Redis for statistics, there is only so much you can do with a hit counter. Another use case is measuring, for example, how long your pages take to render. So suppose you want to be able to do breakdowns for arbitrary time periods, reporting average rendering duration. That means that for every time granularity, you need to keep a running count of how many pages you've rendered and a running sum of how long rendering took for all of them. Then you can calculate the mean outside Redis just by dividing the total duration by the count. Now, this kind of tickles one of my bugbears. I think a simple mean with no indication of variance tells you very little. But fortunately, you can easily extend this to do standard deviation as well. The trick is to keep a running sum of the squares of the durations. That is, we're recording sums of x to the 0, 1st, and 2nd powers, if that helps, um, which is kind of the reason behind these odd-looking names with x0 and so on. But once you've done that, 
you can do a little arithmetic on the running sums for a given time period, and you get the standard deviation of page rendering duration in that time period. So this use of multiple hincrobide commands to record stats at multiple granularities raises another important point. I said earlier that unlike SQL databases, uh, Redis doesn't have any automatic indexes. But in keeping with the database toolkit approach, you can often get much of the benefit of an index by making sure that whenever your application updates the main data, it also updates other data structures that effectively provide an index of, over your data. That is, when you're planning your use of Redis, you need to think about what sorts of queries you want to do and how to use Redis's features to make those queries fast. Then you just have to provide the data needed for those queries. So for this stats gathering use case, breaking down sums into multiple granularities can be kind of seen as pre-calculating what SQL would do with sum and group by, at least if you squint a bit. So up till now, I've only looked at Redis from the point of view of programming rather than ops. In particular, I haven't said anything about how to have your data persist even after Redis gets shut down, remembering that everything's in RAM. This is one of the areas where Redis is really unusual. It has two options for persistence, uh, with different properties, and when you deploy Redis, you can decide whether to use either, both, or neither. So, if you're thinking of Redis as equivalent to a relational database, it may seem a little surprising that never saving any of your data is one of the options. But of course, if you're just doing caching, well, that might be fine. Um, however, most use cases will need you to, um, to, to save some data. Sorry, I'm being told that I'm out of time. Uh, I'll, I'll just go this, through this really, really quickly. Um, there's an append-only file. Uh, every command gets logged to a file. Um, this means that you're very unlikely to lose much data in the event of a power outage. Um, you can, Redis will automatically rewrite the, this ever-growing file for you periodically. Um, there's also this other option, which is RDB, which is a single... Uh, dump taken periodically. One of the great things about this is that um, when you do this, the I.O. usage for actually saving your data is completely independent of write volume. So you can keep on throwing more and more writes at your Redis server and it won't actually need to do any more I.O. Um, how do you choose between the two then? Well, you can use RDB if you need hard maximum latency guarantees and you can accept some data loss after a power outage. Um, most people therefore want to use AOF. They probably have stronger durability requirements. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in Redis that I'm not going to have time to talk about. Um, so, uh, thank you.